All right, welcome back. We're into chapter 1.2, but before we do that, let's do a little review from the last section. So, you discover a microbe. It lacks a nuclear membrane, and you found the microbe growing in a boiling sulfur spring in Yellowstone. So, based on that cell structure and the extreme environment, you would hypothesize that this microbe is most likely, is it A, a bacterial cell, B, a protozoan, C, a fungal cell, D, an archaean, or E, a virus. Go ahead and pause the video now, think about that, and then we will talk about the answer. Okay, so the answer would be D, an archaean, which is the singular of archaea. Um, so what's leading us to this conclusion? Well, first off, it lacks a nuclear membrane. So you know that that means it's a prokaryote, right? Because you watched the last video and learned something from it. And that would lead us to two choices, right? Either a bacterial cell or an archaea, right? Those are both prokaryotes. Protozoa and fungi are both eukaryotes, so they're out. And viruses aren't cells, so they're out entirely. So between these two, we uh, learned that the archaea are most often extremophiles. So the best choice here would be archaea because it's living in this boiling sulfur spring. So that's what it's most likely to be. Okay, let's do one more. All right, which of the following is characteristic of a virus? We have A, viruses are prokaryotic in cell design. B, the cell wall of a virus is similar to that of plants. C, viruses are unable to reproduce independently, or D, viral genomes are made solely of DNA. Go ahead and pause the video, think about that one. All right, the answer would be C, viruses are unable to reproduce independently. So this one's a little tricky. There are parts of this that sound correct, but are uh, factually incorrect. So number one, obviously, that's out A, uh, is viruses are prokaryotic and cell design. They don't have cells, right? They're acellular, so A is out. The cell wall of a virus is similar to that of plants. Uh, again, viruses uh, don't have a cell wall because they're not made of cells, so that one's out. C. Viruses are unable to reproduce independently. That is true. Let's keep that one there. And then D, viral genomes are made solely of DNA. Well, this one's partially correct, but viral genomes could be made solely of RNA. So there are DNA viruses. There's also RNA viruses. So this one is not fully correct. So the best option here would be C, viruses are unable to reproduce independently. All right, into chapter 1.2. So in this section, we'll talk about um, how microbial diseases have changed human history um, and then talk about how uh, microbes kind of participate in human cultural practices a little bit. Um, so this is a, a brief history. I'm a huge fan of history. I love history. But don't get bogged down uh, on dates and things like this. Try and know kind of the general order that things happened in. It should make logical sense, but um, a broad understanding of this is, is what we're going for. We're not looking for super specifics here. So one key point uh, for this chapter, right, is that disease has shaped human history. And uh, this linking of human disease to microbes is a key event in, in history for our society, really, um, certainly scientifically. So we have events like the Black Death, um, which we've all heard of. large portion of the European population was wiped out due to the bubonic plague, which is caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis. So this Yersinia pestis is, uh, when it gets into your bloodstream, it grows to high levels and basically kills you with toxins and other things. Uh, this is transmitted by fleas. So fleas bite uh, an infected individual, suck that blood up, which has the bacteria in it, and then go on and bite another individual and transmit that. Uh, I actually did some research on 
fleas and the plague uh, during my postdoctoral work. We'll talk about that more later in the course, but I know a little bit about it. Um, so very interesting uh, relationship here. But but the Black Death was really critical in um, kind of changing Europe, and it, it eventually, um, after the Black Death, led to the Renaissance. So uh, it shaped history in a lot of ways. Of course, HIV has been very impactful. Um, a, a transmissible virus um, that causes basically a destruction of the immune system. Human acquired uh, immunodeficiency virus um, causes the disease AIDS. Um, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have died from this. Um, we have a large number of uh, people worldwide infected and living with HIV, and a huge amount of research has gone into finding drugs that fight this virus and can keep people alive. Um, we'll talk all about HIV in the virus chapter. And of course, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, which is the disease, that of course has been very impactful on our life. Um, in the United States alone, over a million people have died from that, um, which is quite high, uh, considering um, in an average year, about 30,000 individuals in the United States die from um, the flu. That's, that's an average number. Um, and in the height of the pandemic, we had, you know, over um, probably 600,000 people uh, in a year die from it. So um, over uh, 20 times uh, more devastating to the vulnerable population. Um, we have started to see uh, deaths decrease, but cases keep spiking up and down. Um, we'll talk about why that is in this course, some things about the kind of evolution of viruses. Um, and of course, that has impacted our history greatly um, recently. But uh, at its core, right, the history of microbiology is one that hasn't been around very long. Um, that's because by their very nature, microbes cannot be seen with the human eye. We can see the results of them, like diseases and things like that, but you can't physically see the microbes. And it's really hard to discover things that you can't see, right? Um, so it wasn't until early uh, scientists started playing with microscopes, making lenses and things like that. Uh, we'll talk more about microscopes in chapter three, and we'll use them in the lab extensively. Um, but the first person, as we talked about, to um, observe animal, or the first person to observe tissues under a microscope was Robert Hooke. He was looking at cork, and he noticed that the plant cells uh, he named them cells because they looked like the chambers of monks that lived in a monastery. They lived in these very tiny little cubicles, basically. Um, and so he named these cells after the monk's cell. Um, and Hook put out a, a book that was illustrated called Micrographia. Um, it has all kinds of very cool images in it and inspired people to get interested in microscopes. And uh, another person uh, named von Leeuwenhoek, not related, uh, he was Dutch. He uh, was making lenses uh, for magnifying glasses and things like that. He worked in uh, a thread uh, or a, a cloth shop, and they would look at the threads under microscopes or uh, lenses. And he made such a powerful lens that he was the first person to be able to observe microbes. And we can actually work from his drawings and descriptions and figure out what he might have been looking at. But it's one thing to know that there's all these microscopic things out there. It took a long time still to connect those microscopic organisms with disease. And that might not seem like, why did it take so long? But there's so many microbes out there that don't cause disease. So uh, finding the ones that do versus the ones that don't is very tricky. So you'll see lots of stuff, but it's everywhere, right? How could it, how could it cause disease? Because Everyone has microbes on them, but not everybody has disease. So it took a while to kind of nail this down. Now, at the same time, once we knew these microbes were here, there's a big question. Where do these microbes come from? And uh, there were some competing theories here. 
One theory was called spontaneous generation, which means that microbes just arise spontaneously without parental organisms. Um, there were various problems with this. Um, there was a, a biblical argument against this in some cases because um, uh, everything had to arrive from the moment of creation or things like this. Um, there was also evolutionary arguments, right? Um, we, we don't uh, have a mechanism, you know, with evolution, which was in its infancy, um, to, to really say that things can just appear. Um, and at some point, they had to come from somewhere, right? Because if spontaneous generation isn't true, everything has to have a parent, and where did that come from? Uh, that's, a, that's a much larger question that a lot of people debated and still debate um, quite, quite heavily. And, and there's competing hypotheses about this, the primordial soup and things like this, and amino acids formed because lightning struck and all these things. Um, if you're interested in that, there's just tons of stuff on it. Um, this was an interesting question for a variety of industries, not just, you know, philosophically, but actually for important things like storing and preserving food. If you have a slab of meat, right, uh, how do you keep that from going rancid? And uh, when people realize that, like, meat decay is caused by microbes, uh, they're like, where do these microbes come from? And how can we stop them from coming, right? Because I want my meat to last longer because I want my food to last through the winter or something like that. Um, another one that uh, may seem a little more um, less important than having enough food for winter was the, the wine industry. So Louis Pasteur, who you've probably heard of, there's a famous French institute, the Pasteur Institute named after him, um, he was interested in the wine industry and his research, uh, he wanted to know why does sometimes wine turn into vinegar? So fermentation creates alcohol, but sometimes uh, vinegar, which is acetic acid, uh, can be produced from this and that spoils your wine, right? Uh, so he was basically contracted by the, the French wine industry to figure out why this was happening and how to prevent it. So he was interested in, in where microbes come from. And there was an original uh, couple of experiments by this guy named Spalzani. Um, he, he basically heat sterilized a, a, a jar of meat broth. And so he boiled it and then he capped it. And he left it for a long time and he showed that that boiling seemed to destroy the microbes. Nothing grew in it. Whereas if he left an uncapped one that hadn't been boiled, um, things would grow in it. Um, and even if he, he capped it, um, things didn't really seem to grow in it. But, but people argued, wait, uh, everybody knows that you need oxygen for life and you've capped this. So spontaneous generation can't occur because it's closed. So Pasteur took this and he went, I can devise a very interesting uh, piece of glassware that can solve this problem. So he, he made this uh, swan neck or S-curve flask. So in it, he has this meat broth, which is our growth medium, we call it. And he boils it and sterilizes it. And then there's a tube here that is open to the air, but it has this curve in it, which he hypothesized would catch anything that flowed in. So anything that was in the air, any microbes that existed would go in, but they would get caught right here. They would fall here. Um, and so he set this up. He boiled his medium and he left it out. He left it out for over a year and nothing grew until he tilted the flask and the liquid went into the S-curve and then he sloshed it back in and then suddenly things were growing. So that was one of the key experiments that showed, hey, uh, it's things in the air that can basically be uh, captured that caused this. So that was one of the kind of nails in the coffin of spontaneous generation. We now know, right, all microbes come from other cells. So spontaneous generation is out. Um, but there were some repeat attempts of this where people boiled the stuff and things still grew. And this gets into an important um, kind of distinction. We think of boiling as being a way of sterilizing things, but it's actually not. There are some microbes that can resist boiling at 100 degrees C, um, which is our boiling temperature of water. 
these are called spore forming microbes. They form a tough shell and they're really uh, very dangerous in something like a, a medical um, environment. So medical equipment needs to be sterilized, which means removing all cells, including these spores. And to do this, we have to use a specialized piece of equipment called an autoclave. You may have seen these in like a dentist's office or a doctor's office or something like that. Um, we have one in our lab and I can show you it if you're interested. What it is, is it's basically a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker works uh, by uh, creating high pressure, which raises the boiling point of water. So we can get the boiling point up to 120 degrees C uh, by raising the pressure. And this is not found really anywhere on earth. So no microbes have evolved resistance to this high heat and high pressure. So we can sterilize equipment using these autoclaves, which is really critical and a great breakthrough and is really related to our investigations of spontaneous generation. So there's more information in the book. Uh, if you're really interested in history, uh, it's a great read. I suggest checking that little section out. Um, but for us, you know, microbes have affected our civilization, right? We, we use them to produce food and drink, the wine and cheese and, and all these things uh, that some of us love. Um, you know, they all are the products of microbes. And we didn't even know that the microbes existed, but we saw that these processes were happening. People started getting interesting and in, uh, trying to um, identify what was going on there. Hook and von Leeuwenhoek uh, were some of the first microscopists. Von Leeuwenhoek, the first to see microbes. Um, then we had a question of where do they come from? And that was the idea of spontaneous generation. Um, they just come, but we, we've since realized that there needs to be a parental organism. Microbes only come from microbes. And uh, Spalzani was one of the first to test this with his sealed jar of that meat broth. Um, but then people said, there's no oxygen. So Pasteur made his S-Bend um, flask and uh, debunked that one. And so uh, to tie all this together, all life has evolved from microbial cells. Um, it started with simple organic molecules. Um, uh, and at some point there somehow the first cells arise, but we have not seen new cells arise since then. So everything is related through uh, reproduction basically throughout history um, at this point. So uh, we don't know how the first cells formed. Um, we have hypotheses, but we now know that all life comes from other life from this point on. All right. We will continue on in chapter 1.3 in the next video.